Hi, I'm the History Guy. I have a degree in history and I love history. And if you love history too, this is the channel for you. There's an old adage that says you are what you eat, and while that's likely talking most about the health of your diet, it does illustrate the fact that what a culture eats says much about that culture and likely impacts that culture's history. And when we look at the confluence between diet and culture in America, one food looms large. One food that we eat in larger quantities than almost any other country on Earth. One food that is the primary ingredient in one of the most quintessential of American foods, the hamburger. Beef cattle arrived with the earliest European settlements in the Americas, and beef production and consumption has been a primary driver of American history ever since. Although there were wild bovines in the Americas, notably the American bison, the cattle we use for beef originated in Europe and were brought to the Americas almost as soon as Europeans arrived. On his second expedition in 1493, Christopher Columbus brought some cattle, primarily intended as draft animals. Some of these cattle escaped and feral herds were established. More were taken on Spanish expeditions to Mexico and South America. These cattle were wiry, thin, fast, had long horns for defense, and were hardy and drought resistant. In North America, cattle arrived with some of the earliest European colonists. Cattle were imported to Virginia's Jamestown colony in 1611 and were imported to the Plymouth colony in 1624. These were English breeds, especially the Devon, which is one of the oldest breeds of domesticated cattle. Cattle were not just used for beef, they were used also for milk, leather, and as beasts of burden. As Americas went west, cattle went with them. But the demand for beefsteak grew as populations and wealth grew. Due to the relatively easy availability of land in the United States, meat generally and beef specifically was far more available in America than it was in Europe, where the economics of meat production meant that most meat was consumed by the wealthy. In the United States, there was enough room that herds could be grown near and around cities, and that created a thriving market from early on in the nation's history. That availability of meat was also a driving force in American immigration. When immigrants wrote letters back home in the early 19th century, their relatives often expressed disbelief when they were told that, in America, people ate meat almost every day. Meanwhile, in the Great Southwest, the descendants of the cattle brought by Columbus moved north. Herds may have been grazing in what is now Texas as early as the 16th century. As Spanish settlers and explorers did not fence their cattle, many easily escaped. On the Great Plains, they had no natural predators, and they thrived. For the most part, even Native Americans left them alone, as bison were actually tamer and easier to kill. European settlers brought European breeds to Texas in the 1820s, and those interbred with the wild Spanish cattle, creating the distinct breed called the Longhorn. Mexicans had adopted the Spanish tradition of herding cattle on horseback, and that method was adopted by European settlers. After the Texas Revolution in 1836, many Mexican cattle ranchers left, leaving the cattle behind. European settlers took over the herds. As there was no method for refrigeration, those herds were raised for their leather and tallow, largely used in the making of soap, but not generally for meat. Still, ranching was a profitable business, and by 1855 there were 10 head of cattle in Texas for each person. But the U.S. Civil War changed the beef industry in the United States. Previously, beef in the U.S. came from a local butcher, who was butchering fresh meat. While packaging plants had been producing tinned meat preserved in brine in the United States since the 17th century, the demand wasn't particularly high because fresh meat was usually available. But the huge number of troops involved in the U.S. Civil War led to a great demand for tinned meat to feed those troops. And that demand was central in establishing the cattle feeding industry on the Great Plains in places like Nebraska. But the war had the opposite effect in Texas. When the Union cut off the Mississippi River in 1863, the Confederacy had no access to the Texas herds. Moreover, much of the population that tended the cattle in Texas left to fight the war. Untended, the herds grew. When the war ended, demand in the East, fed by population growth and increasing wealth, was outstripping supply. Meanwhile, in Texas, millions of feral longhorns wandered the Great Plains. Clearly, there was a great deal of money to be made for anyone who could bring those cattle to market. Thus began the era of the cattle drive. But there was a problem. Farmers in Kansas and Missouri didn't like the Texas cattle, which damaged their farms, and longhorns carried a kind of tick that caused disease usually fatal to European breeds, but to which the hardy longhorn cattle were resistant. An enterprising businessman named Joseph McCoy came up with a solution. McCoy realized that rail companies went a more freight business, and that the stockyards in Chicago were perfect for feeding the growing demand in the East. McCoy invested in a small town along a railway called Abilene, Kansas, where he built stockyards and motels. Abilene was west of most of Kansas farming and at the end of the trail that had been established to help supply the Confederacy called the Chisholm Trail. Ranchers in Texas could drive huge herds of cattle up the Chisholm Trail to Abilene, where the cattle would be taken by rail to Chicago, slaughtered and shipped in refrigerated cars to eastern markets. Cowtowns gained reputations as raucous places, where cowboys who had been riding for months spent their pay on liquor and prostitutes. <laughs> 
everyone got rich. The railroads, the ranchers, the stockyard owners, and Joseph McCoy. Based on his vision, more than two million cattle were moved from Abilene to Chicago between 1867 and 1881. The success of his vision is the genesis of the term, the real McCoy. Cattle ranches expanded across the Great Plains, a trend that was made easier as Native Americans were driven onto reservations and the great buffalo herds were hunted to extinction. Cattle funded railroads, which facilitated immigration and further drove the wars to remove the native peoples. Ranchers graced huge herds from Texas to Canada. The Great Plains became known as the Cattle Kingdom amid the cattle boom. But the time of the Cattle Kingdom and the cowboy was short-lived. Initially, excessive demand meant that the herds competed with each other and the land became overgrazed. And then in 1885, a recession reduced demand. And then repeated droughts and harsh winters decimated herds. The time of open-range grazing was coming to an end, and that was facilitated by two new technologies. In 1874, Joseph Glidden, a businessman from Illinois, developed a method to mass-produce barbed wire. The new wire allowed a revolution. Fencing was expensive in the West, since fences were usually made of wood, which is scarce on the Great Plains. Wire fences were less expensive, but they tended to break when pushed by something as big as cattle. Barbed wire was stronger, as it twisted two pieces of wire together, and the barbs kept the cattle from pressing against the wire. Barbed wire allowed the Great Plains to be fenced. But another technology was needed to move from the era of open range to the era of ranching. In 1854, an engineer and inventor named Daniel Halliday invented the first commercially successful design for a self-governing windmill. By the 1870s, the invention was spreading across the Great Plains. The windmill allowed a farmer or rancher to retrieve water from underground aquifers, freeing them from competition over water sources. A college dissertation in 1895 concluded of the windmill, without them, we must emigrate. With them, we can irrigate. The transition was not smooth. Larger and wealthier ranchers were the first to start to use the fencing to cut off large tracts of land, sometimes well beyond their legal claims. So-called fence-cutting wars erupted and often became a form of class warfare between wealthy ranchers and smaller herdsmen and farmers. Probably the most famous of these was the Johnson County War, fought in Wyoming between 1889 and 1893. Nearly 40 people were killed in the conflict between large ranchers and smaller settlers over range and water rights, and the army was sent to intervene. Eventually, the rangeland was regulated with laws that governed the use of public lands. Cattle ranching moved largely to fenced ranches rather than open range. In 1906, Upton Sinclair wrote the book The Jungle, revealing abhorrent conditions in the U.S. meatpacking industry. While he was trying to address working conditions, the public was most revolted by the description of the sanitary conditions. The book resulted in the creation of many U.S. consumer protection laws and a Federal Meat Inspection Act to ensure that meat and meat products are slaughtered and processed under sanitary conditions. Demand for better quality meat led the U.S. Department of Agriculture to start grading meat in 1926. By the 1980s, over 90% of beef sold in the U.S. was graded. But the grading system favors well-marbled meats, meaning grain-fed. So today, most meat is raised on ranches, but finished in feed yards who fatten the cattle on grain. The great ranches largely disappeared, as the ranchers now centered on breeding alone. The shift to feed yards also changed the way that meat was packaged. Instead of shipping live cattle in trains to stockyards in Chicago to be slaughtered, packaging houses were built near the large feedlots where the cattle were being raised. Now cattle were being slaughtered right next to the place where they were being grown, and only the frozen cuts needed to be shipped. The meat changed too, as the demand for better quality beef and ranching practices changed. Scottish Aberdeen Angus cattle were first imported into the United States in 1873. They were found to intermix easily with longhorns. The result was called a Black Angus, now the most popular beef cattle breed in America. The ready availability of beef gave rise to the food that most defines American cuisine today. In the early part of the 19th century, most immigrants from Northern Europe came through the German port of Hamburg, and they brought with them local recipes for minced cooked meat. That dish became popular in American restaurants under the title Steak Hamburg Style, or Hamburger Steak. There are many claimants in the 1880s and 1890s for who invented the idea of putting hamburger steak inside two slices of bread. Who you think invented the hamburger today depends upon where you live. But whoever it was, the idea sold. Americans eat an estimated 50 billion hamburgers each year, averaging more than three hamburgers a week for every man, woman, and child in the country. McDonald's alone sells an average of more than 1,500 burgers a minute. Per capita meat consumption in the United States doubled between the 1930s and the 1960s and reached its peak in the 1970s. Although it has declined some since, Americans are still among the highest per capita consumers of beef in the world. The U.S. Department of Agriculture attributes recent declines to product shortages, which have increased the price of beef relative to chicken. But the USDA predicts that the price of beef will be declining in the next decade and demand will increase again. 
There are significant indications, though, that culture has changed and per capita consumption will never reach the highs that it had in the 1970s. The beef industry is facing new challenges. For example, demand for hormone and antibiotic-free beef and new threats from ever-improving plant-based meat substitutes, which are becoming more popular. And in the most dramatic innovation in the industry, in 2013 for the first time, lab-grown beef, that is beef muscle grown in a petri dish, was ground into a hamburger and eaten. And that new technology might be available in stores in the near future, as several startups are pursuing the technology. Beef production and consumption has been a large driver of American history, as economics and culture are always great drivers of history. But the effect of the beef industry on American history really does prove the adage, we really are what we eat. I'm the History Guy, and I hope you enjoyed this edition of my series, Five Minutes of History, short snippets of forgotten history, five to ten minutes long. And if you did enjoy it, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button, which is there on your left. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to write those in the comment section. I'll be happy to respond. And if you'd like five minutes more of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.